I was given a topic to address, the Purposeful Church. So I'll try to work with the topic uh, of the Purposeful Church. Um, I will preface my message with a couple of statements. Um, Christianity uh, has been around for almost 2,000 years. Uh, if we take uh, the, the day of Pentecost as the beginning of Christianity, uh, that is when the Holy Spirit came upon the church in the upper room, uh, and then Christianity is almost getting to 2,000 years. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, was reputed to have been born somewhere around 4 BC and uh, maybe uh, 1 AD or thereabouts. So if you work 33 years into that, uh, he probably died somewhere around um, uh, 29 AD and some say right up to 38 AD, no matter how you calculate it, uh, somewhere about uh, that time, Jesus died, and the Holy Spirit came uh, a few days after that, uh, 50 days after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so if you calculate by years, uh, the church is just about getting to its 2,000th year of its formation. Uh, that is when we can say Christianity came. Christianity, therefore, is not something that happened just now. Uh, it's been there for 2,000 years. It has a 2,000-year history. And apart from the 2,000 years of Christianity, uh, Christianity has deep roots in Judaism, which had been there uh, longer than Christianity uh, depend on how you calculated another 2,000 years earlier. So, the reason I'm saying this is um, when you belong to something that is old, you, you don't have to treat it as something that is young. Um, you, you don't have to treat it as something that has no roots. Uh, you don't have to treat it as something that has no foundation. Uh, so, Everything we do as Christians, we must be mindful we are not the first Christians. It's been there for about 2,000 years. We are part of a journey. We are part of a journey. And for us uh, who are pastors, to be mindful that we are part of a journey. It's been there for a very long time. Uh, so many things have been said. So many things have been defined. We are not the ones to define Christianity. We are the ones to live out Christianity. There was a generation that defined it. We are not that generation. But sometimes when you hear people pray and preach, uh, you get the impression as if they are trying to define Christianity. Uh, it's not uh, something that started with your birth. Uh, it started a long while ago. Uh, for most people who are Pentecostals, and I am a Pentecostal, uh, and I'm a charismatic too, most people who are Pentecostals have a short-term view of Christianity. Most people think Christianity started maybe with Kenneth Hagin. Uh, something is started with uh, maybe Azusa Street, uh, as far as they go. But Christianity was there before all of these movements, uh, that came around. So when we are thinking about God and the church, because I'm talking about the purposeful church, that's why I'm saying all of this, the church is not Fountain Gate. The church is not ICGC. The church is not even Methodist Church, which is just about 200, almost 200 years old. The church is not uh, the Lutheran Church. The church is not the Roman Catholic Church. The church goes way beyond all of that. And actually, uh, even before Christianity, there was the church. And uh, we will go into that very soon. Um, everywhere Christianity has been, everywhere it has been, 
it has transformed the people. Everywhere it has been. Christianity is the most powerful force of change known to this planet. It's the most powerful force for change and transformation because Christianity is all about change. And when you study the history of nations, wherever Christianity has been, there has been change. Christianity started from Jerusalem. It went to Asia Minor. It went to Europe. From Europe, it went to the United States. Uh, it has come to Africa. And if you track the path of Christianity, wherever it goes, it takes the people who were nothing and makes them something. And today, when we look at Europe, you know, you go to Europe now, you go to the UK, you go to France, you go to Germany, you go to uh, all the European countries, most of them, with the exception of just a few, most of them have turned their back on God. So when you go to Europe, you'll find that Christianity doesn't seem to be alive there. And sometimes I hear people say, look at you in Africa, you say Christianity is the answer, go to Europe. They don't go to church, but they are prospering. The question people fail to ask is, what was Europe before Christianity? Europe was backward. As a matter of fact, the Greeks and the Romans considered the nations such as Britannia, Britain, Germania, Germany, and, and the Gauls in France, they considered them the most backward barbaric people on the earth. They were called barbarians. When you read the, 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 the epistles of Paul and it says in Christ there is no barbarian, who do you think he was talking about? Who, who are those? He, he wasn't talking about Africans. He was talking about the barbarians up there. They were backward. Their religion was very different. The culture was very different. The, the, the lifestyle, very primitive. Until Christianity went there. And it took a people who were backward and accelerated them forward. Especially Protestant Christianity. It is the most powerful force for change in the world. It is said that Africa at this point is the central point of Christianity on earth. The center of Christianity has shifted it shifted from Jerusalem, it shifted from Rome, it shifted from Europe, it shifted to America, it is shifting from America, and all missiologists agree that the next focal point of Christianity is Africa. That means something massive is about to happen on our continent here something transformational is about to take place african christianity is very enthusiastic is very zealous is very robust is very passionate but it is very ignorant too because christianity in africa is a very ignorant christianity and the reason it is ignorant is because we are not paying attention to what Christianity is all about that made it a transformational power. And I hope that what the little I will share today will help us to see the church in its purpose, in its mission, in its assignment, the way Christ Jesus saw the church. So let's go to the word of God.
I'm going to begin from Matthew chapter 16 and uh, from verse 16 to 19. It's a very popular passage that we know of. Jesus announcing his mission to his disciples. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus made this very significant statement in Caesarea Philippi when he announced what he had come to build, and he called it my church. My church. Now, anytime somebody uses the possessive word, my, he is indirectly saying, not yours. Are, are you, when, when somebody says, this is my money, I'm also saying, it is not your money. Because anytime I'm saying something is mine, I'm contrasting it with something else. So when Jesus says, I will build my church, he also had in mind that there is something else he's not building. And we'll have to discover what he is not building. Because he says, I will build my church. For any church to be a church, it must be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any church that is not the church of Jesus Christ is not the church Jesus is referring to. He said, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build your church. He didn't say, I will build their church. He didn't say, I will build our church. He says, I will build my church. There is a contrast there and I would lead you to that shortly. In that statement, I will build my church. What did Jesus have in mind when he said, I will build my church? What was he thinking about? Well, uh, most of you know, especially if you are in a church like Pastor Isu's church, uh, you have been well taught that the, the, the word church in the Greek is ecclesia. And the reason we say in the Greek is, uh, is that uh, uh, the New Testament was written in Greek. Because at the time the New Testament was being written, Greek was the predominant word uh, or language there. So, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John... Uh, used uh, Greek, Paul wrote in Greek, and, and the New Testament was written in Greek. It doesn't mean that the people writing it were Greek people, but they were using the Greek language to express their idea. And it's very important to know that. So the Greek word is ecclesia. Ecclesia is a Greek word that means a gathering of people called for a special purpose. A gathering of people called for a special purpose. It is similar to an assembly or a district assembly or a parliament. A group of people who have gathered because there is a purpose for the gathering. It's not just a gathering for gathering's sake. It's a gathering because there is a purpose. But it doesn't only refer to the group it also talks about the individuals in the group must also be called out. So, for example, if, you, if we look at the parliament of Ghana, 
which is a kind of ecclesia, the, the parliament is a special group. We know that. Because they meet in a special building called Parliament House in Ghana, in Accra. So it's a special group. But everybody who is a parliamentarian was also chosen. He was elected. So not only is the group special, the people who belong to the group are also special. So the, the ecclesia is a special group populated by a special kind of people. A people who have been called to belong to a group that is called. A people who have been called to belong to a group that is called. And Jesus says, I will build mine. I will build my ecclesia. And he gave his ecclesia, the church, a certain militant posture right from day one. He said, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, when he said gate of Hades, he's talking about death. And why does he talk about death? Because death is considered the most powerful force on earth that nobody can resist. But he says, when I build my ecclesia, even death cannot resist it. In other words, no force, no power on earth has the capacity to resist the church. No culture has the power to resist the church. I will build my church now you have to remember the people jesus is speaking this to they are not from the house of caesar they are not royals from the palace of 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 israel they are not the scholars they are not the sanhedrin they are not special people these are run-of-the-mill Ordinary people, fishermen, most of them uneducated, very weak people in society. And yet for them, Jesus says, when I finish building what I am building, you will be so powerful that the most powerful force on earth cannot stand you. You don't have to underestimate the power of the church, even if it is a village church. Even if it is a church under, uh, worshipping under a tree. Even if it is a church that has no church building, has no organ, has no guitar, has nothing, has no screen. If it is made up of a people who are being called and the gathering is a special calling of God, then the gates of Hades shall not prevail against them. The church, therefore, is not identified by its acquisitions not what it has acquired but what it is and whom it belongs to i will build my church or my ecclesia and the gates of hell or hades shall not prevail against it but i want to take this a little further as we talk about the church because jesus christ to all intents and purposes at the time he's speaking he was not speaking greek at the time he's speaking he's not speaking greek so although the translation is in greek the language jesus was speaking was not greek because Jesus was speaking to his disciples. His disciples were all Galilean Jews. So Jesus in all likelihood was speaking in Hebrew or probably Aramaic. Most likely Hebrew, that's his native tongue. So when Jesus says, I will build my church, which is translated as Greek, Ecclesia, the original language he used may not be ecclesia. And I would, I, I would not even say may not be, was not ecclesia. It's like somebody hears Pastor Eastwood preaching, and he's preaching in Frafra. And you report what he has said in English. Yes, you've reported exactly what he has said in English, but the language he's speaking at that material time is not English. We will read about him later in English and we'll have a sense.
But when you also have a sense of the language he used and the word he used at that time, it gives you a better understanding of what he meant by what he is saying. Is, is that not so? It's, 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 it's normal. So, when you consider what word might Jesus have used, what word might he have used when he said, I will build my church? The Hebrew translation of the Greek New Testament uses a certain Hebrew word, and that word is kahal. 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 And uh, when you go to the Old Testament, you see that word used in several instances. And the first time that word is used is in Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 to 4. Genesis 28, verses 1 to 4. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, to take for herself a wife there from the daughters of Laban. May, the, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples. That you may be an assembly of peoples. The Hebrew word there is kahal. An assembly of people is not ecclesia because ecclesia is a Greek word. So the first time God is indicating to the Israel that he, he is not just about their individual lives and, and tribal lives, but, but that he wants to build something bigger. He says, I'm building an assembly of peoples. An assembly of peoples. And the Greek word, the Hebrew word is kahal. If you want to see how to spell it, uh, in the anglicized form, it would be Q-A-H-A-L. Q-A-H-A-L. It means an assembly, a congregation, a congo con convocation. But the word kahal is also used again in Genesis chapter 35 verse 11. And also God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. That word, a nation, is a kahal. A company of nations. So, in God's economy, the assembly he wants to build it's not just an assembly of people sitting down and deliberating and thinking, but an assembly that will also become a nation. So the church is expected to have a national outlook. These days when we think of church, we think about congregations. We come to sit down, there's a seminar, somebody teaches, we hear music, we worship and go, and that's it. But in God's mind, the assembly he's building is not just people who come and listen to a sermon, take an offering and go home, but people who are conscious that they are a nation. They are a nation. They are an assembly that is a nation. A gathering of people that is a nation. So, when Israel grew up, you have to look at the story of Israel. It starts with Abraham, one man, and then Isaac, one man, and then Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau, two, but one sells his birthright so he's chucked away and it's jacob so he's one man one man one man abraham isaac jacob and then jacob has 12 sons 
And so they become the foundation of Israel. The foundation of Israel is tribes. A nation of tribes. Twelve tribes making one nation. So if you are a Jew and you think of your body, your community as God's community, you first also think of yourself as tribes before you think of nation. Because for Israel, you think tribe and then nation. Not nation and tribe, but tribe and nation. And so that is the kahal of Israel. The Bible, Peter, calls it the church in the wilderness. Now Jesus says, I will build my church what is he contrasting it with if it is his he presupposes that there is something else in existence that looks like his but he says i will do mine differently not by what you already know what was he contrasting it with I mean, growing up, my general approach to this passage of scripture was that Jesus was contrasting his ecclesia with the Roman ecclesia or the Roman system. But if you listen to Jesus' teaching, Jesus, Rome wasn't, didn't feature in much of what Jesus said. He didn't bother about Rome. So I, I find it difficult to think that Jesus is contrasting, I will build a different something like Rome. No, no, no. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. I believe if he used the word kahal, then he was referring to an existing kahal. He's saying, I will build my church. The contrast is with Israel. My church will not be like Israel. Because Israel is based on tribes. But I will build something that is not tribal based. Israel, if you study the history of Israel, everything about Israel is based on separation. Israel's entire existence it's based on separation. The law is based on separation. You separate the holy from the unholy, the pure from the impure, the blemish from the unblemished. You always, everything's about separation. Separation from the nations and all of that. And that is why Israel, as powerful as it was, couldn't influence nations much. Because they kept to themselves. They are... God's people separated from the rest of the world. The only time they influenced nations outside themselves is when they went into captivity in Babylon and Persia. Then they began to influence. But for most of the time, they kept to themselves. And the sad thing is, as they kept to themselves, instead of them influencing the nations, the nations influenced them. So Israel's biggest problem with God is that they always wanted to be like the nations around them. So Jesus says, I'm going to build something different. It will be mine. And the gates of Hades cannot stop it. I'm going to build an, a body that is unstoppable. That is immovable that cannot be resisted it will face the gates of hades but it will not be resisted that's what i'm building and i call it mine now most of you are pastors so i can go a little 
I can say a little bit more because you can handle it. Now, when you study the story of Israel, in spite of all the blessing that God said he would give Israel, Israel never became a great nation. Never. Israel was never a great nation in the Bible. They started as a slave nation from Egypt. In the wilderness, they were not great. They went to the promised land. They were not great. They were always being beaten. They were always being Midianites are beating them. Somebody is beating them. Samson will get, somebody will get up, redeem them for a while, and then they are beaten again. They are constantly losing battles. And you wonder, what's wrong with these people? Aren't they supposed to be the blessed ones? Why, why do they get defeated all the time? So they get tired of defeat. And so they said to God, the reason we are defeated is because we don't have a king. God says, okay, if you want a king, I'll give you one. And he'll give you a lot of grief. They say, yeah, we want a king. So God gave them a king. The first one was a bad one. Saul. Saul, losing all his battles. He finally ends up on Mount Gilboa, dead with his son. That doesn't seem like a very promising uh, picture of, of a blessed nation. Out of him comes David. After him comes David. Not bad. Does a lot of good things, powerful things, expands the kingdom a little. But he has all kinds of problems too, moral problems. Then he dies, and his son Solomon comes. Smart guy, good governance, understands how to build, projects oriented, philosopher king. But he does some of the most stupid things in the world. He marries a thousand women. Who, who does that? How are you even going to remember their names? I mean, they're supposed to be the wisest man. I mean, if the wisest man ends up doing this, then you have to now start questioning wisdom in the first place. So then, so there's Solomon. I mean, he does well. He expands the kingdom a bit. Uh, foreigners come to look for him. So this is the height of Israel. And Solomon is the height, the best days of Israel. After Solomon, is Solomon's son Rehoboam, a senseless idiot who ends up dividing the kingdom between the north and the southern kingdom. And after that, if you read the book of Kings and Chronicles, evil after 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 Once in a while a revivalist comes, followed by evil after evil after evil, revival, evil after evil. So obviously the gates of hell is prevailing against these people. <laughs> they, they're, not, they're not doing well. And from there, Israel, the northern kingdom, goes into captivity in Assyria, disperses, and you can't really trace them properly now. The southern kingdom, made of Judah and Benjamin, they go to Babylon, and then later Persia. So that's the end of Israel. That is, that is the story. If you look at it, it's a story of failure. God's people, the assembly of God, the kahal of God, survives for just a few years under David and Solomon. And after David and Solomon, the kingdom just goes down. And Babylon takes them out. And interestingly, when Nebuchadnezzar had built around them, was coming to fight them, there were prophets who were saying, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win. I wouldn't say they are Ghanaian prophets, but I'm saying, they were saying, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win. And people like Jeremiah 
People like Jeremiah say, no, 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 we won't win. We're actually going to captivity. This is not good. This is bad news for us. But Jeremiah begins to say, but God will make a new covenant with you. Something new is on the horizon. It's not going to be like what he did with your fathers, but it's going to be done. So Jeremiah says, something is going to happen. And, and all of them, Isaiah comes and says, yes, something is going to happen. Actually, somebody is going to come. He's going to be a servant. He's going to be a king. He's going to suffer. He's going to suffer. But this is it. The, the future is with this guy coming in the future. Ezekiel talks about it. All the prophets are saying, this one hasn't worked. But God is bringing somebody else. God is bringing somebody else. He's going to build something else. He's going to build people differently. He's not going to build, build them by circumcision. He's going to build them by taking the heart that is wrong out of them and putting a new heart in them and putting a new spirit in them and then he will gather them. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel was bold to see a vision of an army dis defeated in battle. Their bones dry and he sees breath, new life, new spirit coming upon this army and rising up and he says that is the army of God. Are you following the story? So in this picture appears the one that Jeremiah spoke about, that Isaiah spoke about, that Ezekiel spoke about. And now at this pivotal point in Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, he says, I will build mine. Why is he saying mine? Because he's saying that one didn't prevail. But I will build my church, my kahal, my own assembly, my own congregation. I will gather them and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus therefore came in fulfillment of scripture to build that which God intended from the beginning which a stubborn nation Israel could not walk into but this promise was deferred for a new kind of people they will not belong to the same tribe they are going to be picked out of every nation and tribe. They're going to be called a new people. They'll be called the church. Of course, on the day of Pentecost, God to affirm what this was all about dispenses a special miracle where those who receive the Holy Spirit are speaking in everybody's language and people who have come from everywhere say we hear these people talk about the mighty works of God in our tongue and in our language. The gathering of the nations into the nation of God. The gathering of the nations into the nation of God. Now, if we see church, therefore, as Pastor Otabel's church, Pastor Eastwood's church. So and so's church. 
we can say that in a sense just to mean that he's identified with it. But once we speak of it in a possessive way, then we are coming into diametrical conflict with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will build my church. That is why the people in the church belong to him too. Of course, in talking about my church members, I can say my church members, it's, it's a, just a, a language of saying, identifying that they come to the church where I'm a pastor, my church member. But if I cross a barrier in my head, to think that by saying they are my church members, they are actually mine. Jesus will fight you. One of the reasons why I've gone all this long journey to arrive here is because one of the biggest challenges of the African church is that church founders, church leaders do not know it's not their church. They don't know. They will say, I sweated, I work hard, I sow seed. When I heard the call, where were you? But when you didn't hear the call, where were you? That's the bigger question. When you were not called, where were you? The one who calls you is the same one who calls the members. We are all the called. We are all the called. Belong to a called assembly. Pastors, the church is not yours. I'll say it again. Maybe you didn't hear the first time. Pastors, the church is not yours. Men's Otabel, the church is not yours. And the people are not yours. The one who calls you calls them. So if Jesus is the one building the church, isn't it reasonable that we know a lot about Jesus? I mean, it's commonsensical. It is his church. This is the owner. So we have to know about the owner. Who is he? Where did he come from? Where is he going? What does he like? What does he not like? What has he said? What has he not said? What I am saying, is it in line with what he said? Because if we can't answer those questions, then we have assumed, like Israel did, it is God's kahal, but Saul thinks it is his. Rehoboam thinks it is his. Ahab thinks it is his. He can use it anyhow. And for everyone who thought it was his, God resisted them. Africa is the center of Christianity now. We must cleanse the African church and ensure that the African church can be a good custodian of the mysteries of Christ for the next generation. It is his church. 
you are members of his body he is the head of the body and in the body of christ it's not as if the, there's a body of christ and the pastors are under the head somewhere and then after which comes the members going down 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 now we are all members that's what the scripture says of course he gives some special gifts and special callings and special abilities to do special things but it doesn't make them owners of the body it is his church so what should be the characteristic of the church and i will be closing pretty soon i'll go to the epistles first corinthians chapter 12 verse 12 and 13 For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 to 11. And do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. One of the things you notice with Israel is that as a nation, it was very divided. There are too many parts. Too many parts. But in the church that Jesus said he is building, every barrier is removed. Every barrier. And the first barrier that is removed is that there is neither male nor female. It doesn't mean that there are no women and there are no men. It simply means that one is not superior to the other. There are women and there are men. But being a man does not make you superior. Being a woman does not make you superior. There is, that barrier is removed in Christ. Now, if you were a Jew, that will shock you. Because there had to be a demarcation between male and female. Men sit here, women sit there, men do this, women do that, and men cannot do, women cannot do that, and so on and so forth. But he says, in his church, there is neither male nor female. Of course they are, but one is not superior to the other. In Christ, in the New Testament, God has opened a way for both men and women to approach him on equal terms on equal terms second there is no race neither greek nor jew there is no special race that is more blessed than the other it doesn't mean that we lose our races when we become christians i'm still a black man but i'm not superior to any other person A white man is white, but he's not superior. In the church of Jesus Christ, there is no racial superiority. And there is no tribal superiority. There is neither circumcised nor uncircumcised. Being in Christ is not simply a matter of a religious observation but a relationship because israel divided people based on who is circumcised who is not circumcised but in christ 
circumcision matters not. That's what he's saying. He's saying that in Christ, there is neither barbarian nor Scythian. Cultural differences are removed. And there is no social class, neither slave nor free. Now, you see, when we read these things today, they are, very, they are easy because that's how our society has been formatted. So when somebody comes and says there is neither male nor female, it, it doesn't mean anything to you. There is neither bond nor free. It doesn't mean anything to you. There is neither uh, Greek nor Jew. That, it, if you lived in the time of the early New Testament, these are radical statements. In fact, this is one of the reasons why Christianity grew in the first century. Because they removed the barriers. Whereas the Roman society had barriers, Greeks had barriers, Jews had barriers, everybody had barriers. Christianity comes and says, remove the barriers. Everybody, let's come together. We belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Christians could be friends with people who are not their race. S masters could sit in church with their servants and still serve Christ. In their society, it never happened. If you have a higher status, you don't lower yourself. And if you have a lower status, you don't lift yourself. Everybody stays at his level. That is why when I see these kinds of things coming in, to the church I get worried especially when we create a class distinction between those on the pulpit and those in the pew because that is not the church of Jesus Christ the fact that I'm standing on the pulpit and I'm the preacher does not make me superior to the member of the church Christianity is not about barriers. That is Israel. But Jesus says, I will build mine. And if you manage to function the way I want you to function, then nothing can stop you. You know why the early Christians persecuted were able to take over the Roman government, not with force of arms, not even with argument, not with signs and miracles. No, they did it with lifestyle. They did it with lifestyle. The Christians were the only ones who knew how to take care of sick people. Because in those, in those days when infectious diseases came, nobody, people thought the gods have cursed them or whatever. So if you had uh, a disease like a leprosy or cholera, or everybody would leave you. They would leave, actually, people would bring you from the house, leave you in the street to die. The Christian says, no. This is what Christ called us to do. They go to pick people from the streets with sickness, with disease, and take them to places and nurture them. And pretty soon everybody says, these people we've been persecuting, they are a special group of people. Those sick people came to church. That is why Christianity is the foundation of hospitals. Caring for the sick is Christian. Because they understood this is a new thing God is doing. Because in those days, if somebody is not your tribesman, you can kill him and go free. Because your other tribesmen will, will defend you. But Christians reach out to people all over. Reach out to people all over. They went to the deepest places, to Caesar's palace. People were getting converted. They couldn't stop it. The only way was to legitimize what the Spirit has already been doing in the Roman Empire. A subversive group of individuals, beginning from the shores of Galilee, took over the Roman Empire. 
and spread all over the world. Of course, Christianity has had its problems and has had its, its challenges, and it always happens when we start erecting barriers. I am anointed, you are not. I have a special grace, you don't have it. We may be age mates, but we are not grace mates. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> we are not grace mates. What, how were you saved? How were you saved? By grace. How was I saved? We are grace mates. You know why the African church likes barriers? Because the African society likes barriers. We live in a hierarchical society where power must always be concentrated at the top and hammer down everybody. So we become Christians. And although Christ is building something else, we allow our culture to undermine what Christ is building. And if we don't build the church the way Christ wants it to be built, then we will be like Israel, with great promise, yet going into captivity. Africa is the hope of Christianity in the world. If you study the, the story of Christianity, at every point, there is one point, there is one place that preserves everything. At every point. Even Jesus, when he was a baby, at one point he had to go to Egypt and come back. At every point, God would, would develop a place of refuge for his church. And at this point, our continent is the place of refuge for Christianity. You can preach Christ everywhere in Ghana and you will not be arrested. You can preach on the bus, on the trotro, by the roadside, preach everywhere, and you are fine. You go to some countries now, you can't do that. Africa is the hope of Christianity. We must build proper Christianity. Because of, there's too much need and poverty our ministry is now becoming need-based. Whilst we minister to people's needs, they must know doctrine. They must know what is right. They must know who God is. They must know why we believe in the Trinity. They must know why we believe in Jesus. They must know the foundations of their faith. It can't always be about receive, 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 receive. We must also teach in addition to receiving, to receive knowledge, to receive doctrine. To receive sound doctrine. Because let me tell you. In Africa, we preach heresy freely and boldly. African preachers, they, they preach. Because whilst he's preaching, he's manufacturing heresy. He's manufacturing and, and, and the people are eating it because they don't know anything. It may serve us. It may prosper us. It may make us popular. But it is taking us into captivity. It's taking us right into captivity like Israel. And if Christianity dies in Africa, that's it. If it dies in Africa, And Christianity will not die in Africa because people resisted us. But because we polluted it so much that it was no longer Christianity. It's in the church. We preach it, but it's not Christianity. There's no historical faith there. There's no doctrine there. It is all theater and gymnastics and all of that going on. We can fill large auditoriums but it will not be Christianity. That is Africa's challenge. Pollution of the faith. 
doctrinal pollution. Yes, we must minister to people's needs. Yes, people must experience the power of God. What can we do but do that? But in the midst of that, included with that, it's soundness of doctrine. And that's what I want to challenge every pastor here. It's not your church. It's not your people. It's not just about teaching your people to love you and, and, and support you and stand with you. That's, 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 that's given. But more than everything, it's about teaching your people to love Jesus, to love his word, to know what his life is all about, to know what his mission is all about, that we'll build a Christ-centered African church. That is the Christianity we can take back to Europe to re-Christianize them. Because I believe they need re-Christianization. But we cannot re-Christianize them by teaching them prosperity. Because they are already prosperous. We can only Christianize them by bringing them back to the Christ of their fathers who build a noble society with them. And I trust that that will be your heart desire as a pastor, as a church leader, as a church member, wherever you are, whatever you serve, that that will be our heart cry. It will be my heart cry. It will be, a, it will be we breathe Christ, we breathe Jesus. We think Jesus, we talk Jesus, we breathe Jesus, we preach Jesus. Let him feature in your sermons. You cannot preach a whole message and Christ was never a reference point. Let him be your reference point. Teach his wisdom, teach his ways, teach his life, teach his humility, teach the way he, he loves people. And when we build or we are part of what he is building. He has guaranteed us one thing. Even death itself cannot stop us. Death cannot stop us. Look at the early Christians. Death couldn't stop them. They were beheaded. They were cut asunder. They were skinned alive. Some of them were were tarred and lit on fire in palaces. They were thrown to lions. People were slaughtered in front of their wife and children. You would think that any people who face such horrendous persecution would dissipate. But the gates of Hades did not stop the church of Jesus Christ. And I pray that will be our story today. I just want us to spend a little time just to pray and to talk to God. Uh, if you are a pastor, I want you to really talk to God. If you are involved in ministry in any way, I want you to talk to God. If you are just a church member, you're not in ministry, you still want to talk to God. And we want to cry to God and ask him to build his church in Africa. Build a Christ-centered African church. A church that weeps like Jesus and bleeds like Jesus, a church that speaks like Jesus and, and smells like Jesus and talks like Jesus. Let's talk to the Lord about Africa. Help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Touch our continent. Touch our nation. Touch your servants. Men and women whom you have called. The shepherds of the flock, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Recover ourselves from destruction. Recover our minds from our own self-centeredness. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. 
Open our minds. Open our hearts. Give us a new appetite. An appetite for the Lord Jesus. The builder of the church. The maker of the church. The owner of the church. The life of the church. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. Jesus who died now glorified he was crucified he was maltreated he suffered and bled he is Jesus it is his church help us Lord to encounter you in church help us Lord to know you in church help us Lord to have fellowship with you help us Lord to learn how to be in your presence seeking for nothing seeking for nothing asking for nothing just to know you just to love you that i may know him that i may know him to know your heart lord to know your heartbeat lord to know your desires lord lord to know you to be like you to build christ-like christians christ-like congregations people who love jesus and showcase him wherever we are listen to me you know one of one of the tragedies we have in african church is there's so much wrong so much wrong people come to church and they are fighting and they are destroying one another and they are stealing church members steal they steal after church they go and steal they steal in the car park you leave something on your seat after service you come back it's gone this is the place where it should be said you can leave something here from one sunday to the next sunday and you'll come back the next sunday it's still on your seat because nobody touched it that's Jesus. That's Christianity. Not lies and gossiping and stealing and still praying hard but thieves. And let us pray that God will raise up in the church genuineness. We want real Christianity. When I was growing up as a young Christian in the 70s, early 70s we call we didn't even call people pastors i didn't know people were called pastors much less bishop i mean what is bishop that's fine we we call each other brothers and sisters brother so and so brother mensa brother eastwood brother brother and we were not thieves and we love jesus and we studied the bible and people spent time in the presence of god we didn't spend time praying for breakthroughs and, and, and money and wealth. Money will come. But we don't pray for it. It comes. It's a side benefit of following Jesus. If we keep our eyes on him, he says, I will add all the things that the Gentiles seek for. I will add them to you. But if you seek them, you will not find them. So let us pray that God will raise up true Christians, change of heart, moral transformation in the lives of the church in Africa. Not only in Ghana, but all over in Nigeria, in Togo, in Benin, in Ivory Coast, in DRC, in South Africa, wherever, on the whole continent, Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda. We just want to pray for Christians everywhere that the church will be the most noble the most moral, the most upright group of people. If you're going to look for a church, a, a, a job, and you say, I'm a Christian, that should qualify you to get a job. Because you are hardworking, you are honest, you are truthful, you get the job done. That's the revival I'm looking for. Lift up your hands to God. And just... Ask the Lord to build us, build me, build you.
build our churches in a way that brings honor to Christ Jesus. What an anointing, what a presence. Lift your hands as high as you can. Maybe tonight you heard this word and the word has come strongly to your spirit. The Bible said, with the heart a man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Everybody put your hands down now. Maybe you've received this word but you are not born again or probably you've been going to church but you've never made up your mind and today you are saying Lord Jesus come into my heart be my personal Lord and Savior I want to be born again I want God to change my life what a word the ground is prepared the word has been sown you are standing somewhere you want to give your life to Jesus can you lift up your hand wherever you are can you lift up your hand? I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. Lift up the hand. Take it above your head so that I can see it wherever you are. I can see a hand there. I see a hand there. Just pick up the hand. Some of the places are dark. I can't see. Just lift up the hand. Take it above your head. I want to be born again. I want to give my life to Jesus. Those of you with those wonderful, amazing hands lifted, can you come on down to Brother Eastwood to the front here? Just come on down here quickly. What a word you receive. You know what, people? You know what? Look at me one minute. Several years ago, 1980, one night I gave my life to Jesus. And the preacher was Archbishop Duncan Williams. I've never forgotten that day. It has stayed with me up till today. But there is somebody here who one day will say, Dr. Mensah Otabel came to Bogatanga. On that night, I listened to him only once. My life changed. There was a night that changed my life. Tonight is that night to change your life. You are standing somewhere you want to be born again. I'm sure someone spoke to you. You ignored the message. But God brought his vessel, his man, all the way from Accra. You've received it. Bow down your head, close your eyes. You want to be born again. I need 20 more people to come to the front here. I want to be born again. I want to give my life to Jesus. Come closer to me. Don't worry at all. Just come closer to me. Everybody bow down your head. Pray that somebody will come forward. Pray that somebody will come forward. Pray that somebody will repent tonight. Pray that somebody will find Jesus. Lift up your hand and talk to him. I want to be born again. I want to give my life to Jesus. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. And as you are lifting up your hand, come on down here quickly. Everybody in the building, lift up your hand. Say this after me. Everybody shout it. Lord Jesus, 
I confess tonight that I'm a sinner. But you died for me. You were buried. You rose from the dead. I confess my sins and I repent of them. Come into my heart. Be my personal Lord and Savior. You died for me. You rose again. You are alive forevermore. You are my soon coming king. I confess today that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And somebody shout amen. Father, thank you for the lives of these ones. I commit them into your hands and I ask that your name be glorified in their lives. Anoint them with the oil of gladness and let that which is supernatural come upon them strongly in the most holy name of Jesus. And somebody shout an amen.